Welcome to KluCon Weekly. Join us every Wednesday to learn about the latest cutting edge developments in the real time communications industry. KluCon Weekly is brought to you by FreeSwitch Solutions. Get support and professional services directly from the creators of the FreeSwitch open source project, solving your issues in the most efficient, stable, and scalable way possible. Get the FreeSwitch advantage. Visit freeswitch.com. Also brought to you by KluCon the premier technology conference for developers by developers. Join us every summer in Chicago. KluCon kicks off on Monday with our annual hackathon, The Coder Games, followed by three days of technology-rich presentations discussing telecom, WebRTC, and IoT from developers around the world. To learn more, visit KluCon.com or call 877-74-A-CLUE. And welcome to KluCon Weekly. This week, we're going to be going to Mike Mavrudis at Open Sip Summit. Got a lot of things going on there, so uh, we're going to get right to that here in just a second. First, let's go see Miss Abby for the news. Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us today on KluCon Weekly. So, also, happy first day of May, but today we are having KluCon Weekly live from the Open Sips Summit in Amsterdam. So, I wanted to give a special shout out to Open Sips for sponsoring KluCon this year. Thank you so much, and we could not put on this conference without you and the rest of our amazing sponsors. So, thank you all for your support. Uh, speaking of Open Sips and KluCon, at KluCon this year, you should definitely check out our Open Sips training that we're having on the Friday of KluCon. We're also having a free switch training on the same day. So both Open Sips and free switch training at KluCon, that is August 9th of this year, and it is only uh, $299.99. So that is definitely a very special offer. So if you're attending KluCon, I would definitely register for that as soon as you can because space is limited. Uh, more celebrations for our 15th year of KluCon. Uh, for a limited time, you can register for the lowest price that we have ever had in like over a decade at $7.99. So if you already know that you're going to KluCon, I would definitely jump on that price as soon as you can. And if you're not sure, I would definitely make a decision pretty quick because again, that's the best deal we've had in over a decade. So I would definitely take advantage of that. And last bit of KluCon news, when you are registering, make sure to plan to come on August 5th. That Monday is actually our very own hackathon, The Coder Games, and it's a lot of fun. It's a great way to meet people before the conference starts, have a little bit of fun uh, programming and building fun contraptions. And uh, we're also gonna have a Super Smash Bros and Mario Kart tournament. <laughs> so I definitely would recommend hanging out with us on that Monday. All right, and that is all the announcements I have, but if any of you watching have questions for the guys over at OpenSips, definitely uh, let us know in our Slack channel at signalwire.community or in the comments of this YouTube video, and we will try to pass them the questions so that they can answer them for you live right now. So thank you guys, that's all the announcements I have for today, and we're just gonna go straight to the guys at OpenSips. So back to you, Jersey Mike. <laughs> Yeah. to beautiful Amsterdam. We're here at the Open Sip Summit, and it is the end of the second day. We've had two days of speakers, some really interesting talks, and tomorrow there are boot camps? No, then we have tomorrow we have the... Friday there's boot camps. Yes, Friday we have the training, tomorrow we have the design clinics to, to help the community, and we also have the interactive demos show up with cool stuff about OpenSip 3.0. So, so Bogdan, let's talk about what's going on here. Well, uh, it's uh, this edition, it's I think uh, is the fifth edition in a row in Amsterdam, and I think we want to stay here for, for the next uh, for the next year. It's a good experience for us. It's a good experience as far as I understood for uh, all our participants. Um, so, yeah, we will stick for a while in uh, in, uh, in Amsterdam. And, um, well, a couple of uh, interesting things about uh, the event. Um, we're looking with, uh, with you know, other colleagues and uh, organizers over the, you know, uh, different kind of data for, uh, from, the, from the conference. And, um, well, it's interesting because this year we had, like, maybe 60, 70 percent 
like new people joining uh, to the to the summit. So we, um, from outside, it seems to be an attractive uh, conference, and uh, we love it, especially this year because we had a quite huge interaction between speakers and uh, and the audience. I mean, there were so many questions asked uh, that well, we had to actually cut some time just to be able to. Uh, you know, uh, fit the time slots. But uh, there was a very uh, dynamic interaction between uh, the people participating uh, um, to the conference and uh, between uh, between the speakers. And uh, yeah, and that's that's always that's always a special interaction because when you when you engage the people in the audience, you know they 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 get a much better feeling as attendees that they that they that they're learning and participating. And adding and contributing. And think about the next year because now we learned the secret from from uh, from uh, David uh, to give out candy. Uh, no, 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 not about candy. Like how to do better presentations. Like uh, what are the common mistakes when geeks are doing presentations? So now, so he was actually he was on KubeCon Weekly last week, and we and we did that as well. Oh, okay. And yeah, so, so I used some of his <laughs> recommendations in in my speech today. Yeah, for me it was too late to, to fix my presentation according to, to his rules. Hopefully, okay, it was good enough. Uh, but yeah, that means uh, next year we should have even better presentations in terms of uh, how they are structured, because in terms of covering uh, topics and uh, the, let's say, knowledge or the experience uh, shared with the people, definitely there were more than 100% uh, uh, good ones uh, this year also. So, but I, there was a lot of educational stuff. Like I was, I was very interested in the memory debugging stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was. Um, we tried to go through different kind of, let's say, level of knowledge from, you know, overviews in terms of uh, concept platforms, and also going all the way down uh, to show how to actually debug memory leaks. I mean, that's something that uh, okay, you don't see usually in a in a, in a conference. I mean, it's. Uh, it's uh, too technical, and uh, probably, you know, um, there are not so many people doing that. But nevertheless, it was an interesting topic actually suggested by the audience um, because, yeah, it helps them in terms of uh, operating uh, platforms. You know, in terms of how to fill in bug reports and, and uh, <coughs> things like that. So, yeah, it was a uh, uh, unique experience, I would say. And then there was another unique one too because. You know, asking the audience what they wanted for one slot, and then to do turn and stir. Uh, yeah, yes, we had a an, uh, an, uh, slot where we let the uh, audience decide to decide uh, what should be the topic to talk about, and uh, um, surprisingly, uh, they wanted to talk about uh, steel and shaken, which is lately a bit of a topic. And uh, yeah, there was an interesting. Uh, we did that for the first time, and it was an uh, interesting uh, outcome. There were like um, several people from the audience involved in the discussion. It was like a let's say completely new topic for everyone, including for uh, for me, which I had to <coughs> I had to do the actual uh, well, presentation about that, uh, the initial digging into the topic. Um, but uh, yes, it was again uh, pretty cool because we had. Uh, people from the audience start talking to each other and uh, uh, debating ideas and contributing with different kind of bits and information about uh, about the topic. So everything was dynamic on the spot. And so I gave people lollipops when they got an answer right. <laughs> At one point, you actually tried to get someone your laptop when you got an answer right. <laughs> because I slipped and said the wrong thing. I wasn't actually going to give them the laptop. <laughs> so, so Alex, what did you? Which talks did you like? Um, I, I think this year there's been quite a bit of focus on geo redundancy scaling. Um, anycast, anycast. Everyone's everyone. talking about anycast. Yeah. So you know, last year was some of the earlier pioneers doing demonstrations of anycast and going, "Look, I'm going to take this node down, and it will appear over <coughs> here." But I think Bogdan, correct me if I'm wrong, but in the latest version of OpenSips, there's a lot more support for um, moving RTP between. Yes, we are anchoring the RTP yep. with uh, different media relays during uh, during the call. So yep. that will definitely help in uh, in such scenarios when you have to geographically migrate calls into let's say completely 
different set of servers, different data center, and everything. Yeah, makes it more easier to uh, to do. So I think there's a, there's a lot of focus this year on <coughs> people saying that this is this was our journey. Originally it was VMs, now it's containers. Now we're looking at Kubernetes. Now we're looking at multi-cloud, hybrid cloud. Um, I think it was Alex Goodis that said that AWS is a known quantity, but we don't <coughs> control it. We're control freaks. We need control. So having stuff on multiple cloud providers, any cast, be able to you know re-anchor everything mid-call. This well, is all very interesting. And again, that's what that that's what these conferences are all about. Like, so if people want to learn about free switch, they they go to they go to ClueCon, mm. you know, which is every August. And you know, when people want to learn about open SIPs, they come here. And so that's where you find the most bleeding edge technologies for each one of the different segments and I, I, you know, I, software platforms. I, I agree, but the, the nice thing about all of the open source conferences is it's not just Completely focused on one particular bit of software, you, you find crossover. You find, you know, the, oh, there's always crossover. The, yeah, the, there's some people that say, actually, you know, this is my preferred way of doing something, and someone else goes, no, that's rubbish. You should do it this way. And there's no correct answer. <laughs> there's never it's, a correct it's answer. It's wonderful. It's always the correct answer in the eye of the beholder. Absolutely, and you you see during some people's presentations, they go, oh yes, I'm I'm storing my CDRs on Microsoft Access, and you hear. You know, someone else said, <laughs> <laughs> but no one actually said that. No, no, let me just make that clear. No one actually said that. But you know, so someone says Cassandra, someone else says MySQL, and there's a, there's a divide in the room. Um, because they should be shot. Well, <laughs> horses for courses. <laughs> Dan, what do you like? Yeah, so us coming from a technical project, sometimes too much technical, it's uh, it's a bit overloaded, but what, what I, I found out very interesting was few talks not really technical related, but for technical people. So for example, uh, David, like the one which you already mentioned, was talking for for, for people to increase their uh, ability to, to talk, to, to present, yeah, yeah. To, to present uh, themselves in a good manner. And then what was also interesting was uh, Celestes, so Celestes Mangani from uh, Homer Project. Mm -hmm. She she approached it also another talk from a different way. That was a way. very good speech. Yeah, this like, is what, I, what I liked. It was, yeah. it was something original because, uh, you know, all these uh, technical, highly technical um, talks, we, we hear them often, but this ki kind of particular things were not really approached all the time. So it was not at all a commercial talk, so it was still <coughs> for technical people, but from another approach. So I enjoyed this particular tool coming from a, a technical person. So uh, I think it was it was really original. And, and can you, for, for the people uh, watching us, just a couple of words about what was the message from uh, Celeste's presentation, because of, probably they, have, uh, they haven't uh, seen that presentation. And OK, we are talking about you know what interesting topic was, but the question is, for the people watching, okay, what was the topic? <laughs> yeah, so her topic was uh, something related, what if your business succeeds? And um, like reverse engineering a, a success story from, from her point of view. So she, she touched also uh, sensitive uh, things like where should be the border between open source and commercial from the point of view of, of uh, software development, how much <coughs> you should go into asking, and whether you are entitled uh, to to ask for for uh, funding features or and, yeah. features, and ask I, I, I thought that was I thought that was customers. a really interesting question from the audience because it, it, I, I think that's a challenge when it comes to running like one of these large open source software projects. I think it's a real challenge for the developers to kind of you know. They, they, they know what the right thing to do is, but in the end, the large-scale users also, you know, want to kind of dictate how they want the software to work with in their specific configurations. And so it's, it's almost like a little bit of like a battle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I, I think this, uh, and of course, like like you already said, they, they are very uh, high <coughs> level of, of uh, and they were high level of, of talks, like um, uh, always. And also, for me, the biggest opportunity is also to, to meet with the community. So to, to put like a, a face on top of a person on the mailing list, and also from their side to, to meet, meet with the speakers and exchange information, because many of the, of the uh, 
um, the, the, the big ideas came from interaction of the people. I, I'm sure, especially with FreeSwitch, there were many times where, or many modules coming from Klukon, just because people have talked about it. I think that's, that's it's true of every conference, that it's not always what happens actually in the conference that you can see on the YouTube stream or you can see on, a, on a, some sort of catch up afterwards. It's what it's, happens it's behind the scenes. What happens behind the scenes, the conversations over beer, over dinner, over coffee. Um, it's those conversations that, you know, one person's idea can spark a whole new feature. Right. Yeah, basically, doing such conferences, you are just blending the seeds for you know, crazy ideas or future I don't know, features or uh, uh, things to uh, things to do. But, you know, just having people <coughs> together to do the social networking, to talk, to share experience, and you know, maybe each person comes with different bits and pieces on a you know, topic or something. And it's uh, every, uh, at the end, it reduces to the idea, you know, uh, more brains. Uh, do better things than only one. So you need a place where to put the brains together. It, it's also it's also being in, in this unique venue too, because I, I remember going to my first ClueCon, and you know just just being like, oh my god, that's Ken Rice by the elevators, and like, <laughs> just being thinking like he's like a god. Should I go talk to him? I don't know if I should talk to him. <laughs> and we all know I did. <laughs> I think just, to, just to add to that, it's very, very easy, especially if you're from a, you know, from, from a technical background and you maybe haven't got the greatest social skills. That you spend a lot of time in front of a computer, not interacting too much with, with other people on, on the, that high technical level. Coming to conferences, it's it's actually you know for me, it's quite an enjoyable little break away from all and to to meet like-minded people because you know I don't have these sort of in-depth technical conversations on an average week. <laughs> yeah, because they, in the end, there's so few of us, right? Yeah. <laughs> and you also increase your chances, I think, as a, as a community member, when you raise an issue, like an anonymous, you're not taken that serious, like when the, 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 the person who, who helps you from the uh, software development side knows you personally, mm. because they already treat you uh, like more serious, because they know you, you are involved more seriously into the project. Yeah, it's 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 you know we've seen from from your mailing list for CG raids from the from the free switch mailing list. It's very easy just to, to go on and bombard the developers with questions. But sometimes it's easy just to get together at one of the conferences around the world to say, look, can we grab a coffee, can we have a chat, oh, absolutely. You know, can you help me with a couple of problems? And and, and and it's you know there there's no there's there, there's no other arena where that can <laughs> ever happen. Like that's what it comes down to. Is that that's one of the things that is just so engaging for me personally. In open source is the fact that you know if, if there's something you don't understand, you can you can go directly to the software author, and nobody has better insight yeah. on that software than the author themselves. Absolutely, right? And, uh, it, and you know, Slack, IRC, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, very good, but then nothing beats being in the same room. As, Absolutely. As the same you, time. you look them eye to eye and you speak with them and you know ask them the questions you need and you know hopefully get the answers. <laughs> well, actually, that's uh, that's the whole idea with uh, with the design clinics because yes, you can do it in a how to say ad hoc way, like grabbing some somebody on the corridor, like hey, let's talk a bit about something, you know. That's or you can actually have lot. something that's scheduled and yeah, it's like a more in a, in a you put it in a you know in a format so it make makes it easier for uh, for uh, for everyone you know uh, scheduling uh, like uh, uh, an, uh, an hour discussion with uh, with uh, uh, with the developers just to go through maybe some ideas some concept maybe some design you you have in mind just to be sure that. Let's say the, you are on the right track from the very beginning, and you don't have to spend time and resources going back and forwards, you know, exploring the uh, already known dead ends, <coughs> or maybe you just want to get an advice on how to do certain things. Um, at the end, you know, it, it's an hour, but there are not so many things that you can do within an hour when it comes to discussing about presenting your idea and then trying to get some uh, some feedback. But nevertheless, it's probably like. Uh, uh, Hundred times better than trying to get the same results through a mailing list or through an IRC uh, channel. So that's uh, one of the reasons we said, okay, let's let's do this uh, kind of design clinics each year, and uh, because we already are here together with uh, with uh, uh, part of the community and uh, presenting uh, different kind of uh, 
uh, new uh, ideas and uh, new releases, new features and so on. So why not trying to help in a more particular way the, the, uh, the community by, okay, let's take a look at your you know, particular case and try to provide some, uh, some uh, feedback, some help in uh, how, to, how to do it. So how does it work? Do you, do you provide them advice on their configurations? Or are they, is it like an open I, discussion uh, where they, you know, kind of like say, they talk about like potential feature sets in upcoming releases? What, what, what exactly is it? So first of all, I wouldn't go so far to call them advice. That's a very dangerous thing to give advice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's say we do feedback. <laughs> it's, it's more neutral. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so the idea is, okay, they, uh, people, either they want to clarify an issue or they simply want to get something validated or maybe they have, uh, they uh, want to make some planning, uh, for future planning and uh, they just want to say, pick up your brains in terms of what would be next year in terms of, as you say, features or especially missing features and, uh, and so on. So basically they present their case in terms of uh, all these and then it's uh, just a discussion uh, around, uh, around the topic. But uh, it's, it's a very open, uh, <coughs> open uh, concept, and again, uh, it, it can be multiple uh, um, kind of issue they may come with. Including, like, I would love to see something like this into OpenSea, so I, I build a platform, or I plan to build a platform, and then maybe I want to do it like that, and do you think it's okay or not, or, you know, based on previous experience, and so on. And so on. That's, you know, I'm attending the design clinic tomorrow because I'm going to turn up with paper and pen and say, look, this is roughly what I want to do. Is this a good idea? Is this a bad idea? What do you think? And it's, at uh, conferences, I think, you know, we, we all agree that it's very easy just to grab a developer after, after you know, a talk or in the corridor by the elevator. You know, I mean, you've got a couple minutes. <laughs> but it's very, very kind of compressed quickly. That's, you know, just speaking at 100 miles an hour, trying to get it all out when it's, when it's fixed half hour, one hour appointment sessions. The, you know, and there's an, you need to provide an abstract. This is what I'd like to talk about. It gives you some time to formulate your questions and, you know. Uh, in the previous years, we, we saw like uh, very, let's say, people coming with very wide concepts, you know, for like uh, overviews, or maybe with a very particular kind of, uh, let's say, uh, problem they may have, mm -hmm. like uh, coming up with a, that's my design, what do you think about it? Mm -hmm. Or maybe going straight. Hey, you know, I I I love let's say the TLS support, but <coughs> I just want an extra feature uh, as a nice support uh, because I want to do also some kind of a crazy authorization for the for the endpoints through the TLS connections, and also a really particular extension in some something already existing. So we saw different kind of uh, requests from this perspective. It'd be interesting to to see after tomorrow's workshops after. The, the clinic, sorry, the you know what sort of topics come up compared to the previous years? Yeah, that's uh, I would say that's a surprise, and to a certain point, it's quite challenging also for from uh, from our perspective because yeah, you know, you people do expect to provide some useful information for them, uh, and uh, you know to un to be able to understand uh, from the very beginning what they have, they have to go through understanding their exact uh, issue and then to to try to to help. And some, sometimes it's a bit uh, of a difficult <coughs> process, to be honest. Um, regarding this design phase, I think it's a very interesting uh, concept because, uh, as far as I could see, uh, th there are no slots left, so it's it's hard to get a slot from the from a person to to get a slot with you. They they need to schedule it in time, right? Well, if you think about okay, you, you have maximum six or seven hours of roll. You know, considering a lunch break and so on and so on. So and uh, okay, we are like uh, limited in terms of how many sessions we do doing at the same time. You know, uh, so everything it reduces to pure mathematics. You know, take the number of hours, number of people, and that's the maximum capacity you can do in one it day. It must be exhausting at the end of the day, though. Uh, yes, it is. Yeah, actually, it's, uh, from this perspective, it's even worse than uh, that uh, regular conference day. <laughs> when, okay, if, if you are. Yeah, you, get, one, you, you have to do one one talk, and that's it. Yeah, for, the <laughs> for, for the time slot, and then after that, you relax, and you sit yeah. in the audience, and you watch stuff, you know.
Well, but uh, we we uh, we uh, we love to do it because sometimes uh, you know th from these kind of discussions, uh, you know, different you know uh, future ideas may boil into you know things that may happen, and let's say in terms of um, open source concepts uh, for the for the next releases. So it's uh, it's also a good opportunity for for us to try to understand what people do want to use open source for. So what are their expectations in terms of uh, as uh, on, uh, on software, so we can try to address that to be as much as possible closer to, uh, you know, to the needs of, <coughs> of the community of the users. Because otherwise, you know, it's no purpose in just making, you know, a software that actually doesn't address any kind of need. <laughs> well, it's so flexible. I mean, it could be configured to do really anything. Well, yeah, um, <laughs> a lot of things, but still, we're working on anything. <laughs> <laughs> So on the on the topic of software releases, you just entered into three beta, right? Uh, yes, uh, um, happened more like um, two weeks ago. Yes, uh, uh, what was that in last year in December or when we had the uh, on Weekly when we discussed about the planning? Well, that was that was that was just two or three months ago, wasn't it? That was uh, this year, I think. Was it? I, I, yeah, I, sorry, I don't remember. Yeah, could be. And uh, yeah, we. Uh, we talked at that plan uh, at the uh, time about the plan for the 3.0 uh, major release. Um, now it happened, uh, like uh, two weeks ago. We we had uh, we had this uh, release, and um, that there are like two important things about uh, this uh, this release. Uh, first, because uh, of course we uh, uh, we move up from 2.x to 3.x, so it's a it's a Major kind of uh, uh, switch into into the um, uh, what OpenSIP is, and uh, secondly, uh, we address because in the previous uh, in all the releases we try to address a certain topic. Like uh, last uh, last uh, year release was about uh, uh, clustering. Uh, uh, two years ago was more about the integration, and also okay, what should be the what should be this. Um, uh, 3.0 release and uh, was a completely different approach. We didn't want to focus necessarily on features in terms of uh, uh, you know SIP related features like uh, crazy routing or uh, services and so on. We actually uh, focused on helping the community and making from the let's say des DevOps, uh, dev DevOps perspective a better uh, software. So. Uh, in terms of uh, helping the community to write configuration files and to manage open seats to uh, address different kind of uh, operational issues when you run open seats. So that was our main focus was again something completely new because previously were features were the features were more important rather than the operational aspects. Uh, but uh, um, you know the the feedback we got from the, from the community in regards to this uh, release. Uh, uh, prove that uh, that's that's a field uh, where you know every kind of any kind of work and investment it's more than welcome because you know it doesn't matter how good the software is or any kind of tool doesn't really matter if it's a super tool or whatever if you cannot handle it you cannot you cannot work with it that's a useless tool so yeah we have a great tool the open system can do many things with it. But at the same time, it has uh, it has to be something that uh, you know you can operate in a in a relaxed uh, uh, way, so you don't have to be afraid to go to bed. You don't have to be afraid whenever you have to change something. So, uh, well, I think my favorite feature is when you're talking about changing something <laughs> because because I use I extensively use local stores, right? And the fact that you can reload a config and keep out all the way, everything in memory, I mean, that's awesome. Yeah, those are two two important uh, features, uh, basically addressing, um, let's say, the fear of a of a restart, because restarting any kind of service usually translates in a small outage or big outage, depending on how lucky you are with the restart. Um, but, uh, yeah, and if there's no mistakes in the config. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, yeah. So the uh, ability to reload. During runtime, the config, so basically making change in the configuration file uh, without the need of a restart, or to minimize the downtime during a restart by uh, preserving um, 
uh, data into memory so you don't have to recache stuff, uh, uh, mainly routing information when you, when you start again, that will dramatically reduce uh, the need and then the time when your service uh, may be down because of you know applying changes. So that's why we said it, okay, everything is focused on uh, uh, on uh, on the operational, so to make it as simpler and safer, uh, you know, to to use. The um, the yeah the the list of uh, of uh, features in this direction it's uh, I wouldn't say a long one but it's an interesting one we're going to have uh, tomorrow in uh, parallel with the design clinics we have this uh, interactive demos when we're going to show uh, interesting things uh, hands-on experience uh, like uh, how to do <coughs> how the actually how the uh, auto scaling works with the uh, you know, so the ability to create on demand based on the loads new processes or terminate uh, processes of something yeah, that that's pretty good feature. Yeah. yeah that's uh, yeah that's uh, that's something that uh, was I would say uh, needed for a long long time so the ability to you know to automatically scale depending on the, on the load without uh, having you know being limited to yeah you have to configure a limited number of uh, so what's the overall of, impact of that so let, let's say let's say like you get hit with like a horde of registrations or like a substantial like nighttime. There's very few calls during the day. There's there's high volumes, and so you know I guess you don't run out if it, it as let's say when you set the the initial number, um, it, that number will increase or decrease based on the, the utilization. Uh, yes, exactly. Because you, in all the systems you have, so you have quite a huge uh, variation in terms of uh, of, uh, of uh, load. Uh, like uh, maybe some customers are waking up, maybe some you know businesses are starting up, uh, so they start pumping traffic into into the into the system. Um, also, you have to take into consideration different kind of. Let's say events during the day or events during the year that may increase traffic or unfortunately overlapping to multiple events like this. Uh, translating into, you know, right now you have, uh, let's say, 100 calls per second, and uh, probably in uh, one hour you have like 1,000 calls per second. So, what do you do? You wake up during the night and uh, uh, increase <laughs> the number of processes and restart everything just to be able, to, just to be sure that, you know, we are. Your uh, your setup is able to handle the necessary number of you know uh, calls per second. Um, at least that was the old <laughs> approach. Um, right now it's uh, with the auto scale. It's simple. You, you don't care. It, it will allow to scale by itself. It will automatically create more processes to handle the additional load. So you can sit tight. <laughs> and and it and scales down too. So you so you're you're not using. It's yeah. much, it's much it's, so it's almost like it's energy efficient too. Um, it's green. It's almost like green software. Well, you know, it's good for the environment. Uh, yes. Okay. Um, we thought in a different way. We thought you know people are more and more using uh, um, running software in uh, in clouds. Right. And, and so those and are the guys then, that really then, started with the auto scaling groups and all that stuff. Yeah, but they you know you have uh, you have the problem that in many cases you pay by the resources that you use, so you have to be a bit careful in terms of uh, you know uh, overscaling your platforms just to be on the safe side and to, to cope with the peaks of traffic. Uh, while let's say maybe six hours per day there is almost no traffic, but you still have like hundreds of processes just in case. So right now. Uh, you don't have this uh, need, so the system load, I mean, the open system automatically scale down, uh, consuming less resources, uh, resources trans uh, trans uh, which translate at the end of the day in uh, less uh, and uh, smaller cost <coughs> when it comes to what you have to pay for the uh, to the cloud provider, because you may pay by uh, uh, CPU uh, cycles, how much memory you use, and so on. So there are different kinds of uh, Ways of uh, you know uh, monetizing all these uh, uh, clouds. Uh, so in that case, you are more efficient. Not necessarily like being green, as you said, but that's also okay. But being more of cost efficient in terms of uh, you know the resources that uh, that you use. Yeah. 
So what are some of the other features? Um, yeah, we, we kept uh, talking about um, the operational side, but uh, talking uh, also on the dev uh, development side. Uh, by development, I mean uh, developing uh, um, OpenSIPS-based uh, services, or no, not uh, code uh, development. Um, we have uh, this um, uh, generic integration with um, uh, text preprocessors. Which is quite cool because <coughs> it's not only one text preprocessor. We can do any kind of uh, preprocessor. So you can uh, uh, you can use in your scripts uh, M4 or G2 or whatever you know whatever you already have in uh, on, on the system, and uh, uh, it's directly used by uh, by OpenSIP. So you don't have to keep working with the template files, with the actual config files before restarting, or oh my God, I changed in the wrong file or I my file was overwritten when you know that uh, the actual config file was generated by the preprocessor before. So there were quite a few issues with that. Right now, yes, <laughs> there's a git for that. Uh, you know what's uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, the, what's the, actually the worst uh, the worst uh, situation? You work with the M4 template, which is actually the let's say the master copy of your config file, mm -hmm. and then uh, okay, you have a uh, file which is the C actual CFG file that you feed into OpenSIP, which is generated let's say just before the runtime. That's the uh, old approach. Well, of course, um, if there are like uh, config errors or whatever runtime errors related to the script, they will be re reported as line number. Um, <coughs> yes, they will be reported uh, relative to the actual CFG file, and then good luck with going and correlate with the template file. Uh, with this, uh, with the new built-in support for text preprocessing, it will automatically translate back and report everything to the template file, so you don't have to go through the actual CFG. It will be basically invisible for you, and again. OpenSIPS will take care to, to do the line correlation between the, the, the actual config before and after applying um, uh, the, the preprocess of that. So that's uh, pretty pretty cool, I would say. So we have some we have some questions. Madison asks. Oh wait. Okay. So Abbas Ahmed. Hey guys, please do. Share what's on the roadmap for open SIPs over the next two years. Thanks. Wow, next two years. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, can, can we see your outline? <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, that's uh, quite a long time to do planning. I mean, we are just uh, we just um, I would say closed the cycle of uh, of a new release of uh, the three zero. Um, we haven't yet made a plan for the next release, not even for the next release. So not to mention the next release is covering the two years. Uh, still, well, even even the two point three release was like within a year, right? No, we do one release per per year. I mean, basically that's the uh, that's the policy. And uh, we like it or not, we have to do it before the OpenSIP summit because we need new material to talk about during the summit. So yes, we need to have a new release before the summit. So that's more or less how the things to work for us. Um, so uh, yeah, two years will translate in uh, basically two releases. So that's a bit too much to be able to say what will be done. But um, well, for at least for the next uh, for the next release, we want to keep uh, investing some work into uh, simplifying the, how you do the scripting. There were some uh, opposite scripting. There were some um, ideas uh, left over, uh, over from uh, from the 3.0 release because okay, there was not enough time to do everything what we wanted to do. So uh, yeah, we want to continue simplifying, making more. Easy flexible and powerful from the scripting perspective and eventually um, making a nice integration with uh, other uh, languages so rather than native language <coughs> like uh, having the built-in inline for example support for Python for Perl for any kind of other languages right now there is something like that but it's uh, more like uh, not so handy to be used so we really want to improve that part uh, restructure. See, I, I like the I like the config file because you know if you check it ninety percent of the time, it's gonna run, right? Yeah. 
And so th there's something there's something kind of special about that. Once you start getting into the other languages, if there's a mistake in the language, that's it. <laughs> you know, and that won't be picked up by the preprocessor, right? Um, depends on the language on how it's interpreted. If it's something like runtime based, or if you you can do some precompiling. So okay, yeah, you are not sure how it will uh, translate into errors, like syntax error or runtime errors about uh, in, in that. But okay, yeah, that's that's something that we want to um, explore just to give these options uh, option uh, to uh, to the people to use. I'm not saying I like a replacement. Uh, but um, to be able to, ins to, to insert like, uh, you know, a uh, snippet of something else rather than the native language in your script. If you want to, let's say, do some uh, really complex, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, processing in the script, maybe some string operations, maybe some you know, weird algorithm for sorting uh, and so on. In that case, it might be easier to do it in, I don't know, let's say, in Python rather than complicating <coughs> your life to do it with an HTML <coughs> config. Um, uh, because the, the native language is more oriented into routing, not necessarily generic programming. <laughs> so. so, okay, you ready for the second question? Okay. Uh, this is from Ralph Groking, tries to. Um, try to open OpenSIPS for my first time. All documents on it are old, though. Any place I can find documentation is on the installation. That's weird. I'm trying to, okay, let me try to read the question. I think the question kind of is that there's, there's a, I, I found the same thing, there's an awful lot of OpenSIPS documentation and some of it talks about previous versions like, for example, you know, the OpenSIPS free switch integration guide, there's a couple of those floating around, some of them are newer, some of them are older. Uh, okay, the, the actual documentation, made, uh, it's uh, structured in two ways. Uh, first, it's what we call the manual, which is quite well structured per version. Mm -hmm. So you can go for, let's say, read everything what's script-related, module-related information, which is particular to each open source version. At the same time, we have this, um, because you mentioned it, uh, um, advanced tutorials for like how to do free switch integration, how to do asterisk integration, or whatever kind of uh, more complex uh, scenarios. And uh, indeed, though some of them, they don't have a, they are not labeled for a specific version because maybe some of them will cover multiple versions. Um, so, okay, that's a bit, uh, that's a bit, uh, let's say, the gray area. <laughs> yeah, but I, I would say, like, if, if, I was gonna, if I was gonna start with open SIPs for the first time, I, I would do two things. Install the binaries, right? So you add the repository, add the key, install, right? And open, use the open SIPs configurator. Nevertheless, all these steps, like installing, getting it up, creating a database, you know, starting and everything that's documented for each version, uh, you know, in the manual. So these are the first steps that you, uh, you will find in the, in, the, in the manual. So including what you said, if you want to generate a special, uh, you know, particular config file with, uh, with a built-in uh, uh, script generator tool. Yeah. And there's the, the book yeah. too. Sorry? The book as well. The book? Do you talk about the book still? Is, is that relevant? Is that up to date? The there was a book a couple of years ago, an open source book. Well, yeah, let me remember. That was covering, I think, maybe 2.1 or 2.2. Mm -hmm. Let's say from, uh, I think it's 2.1. So um, <coughs> the fundamentals are somewhat yes, the same, though. The fundamentals <laughs> no, they yeah. are, though. I have an open stair book that I still look at every <laughs> once in a while. <laughs> no, yeah, I'm just thinking uh, for, for, for someone who's, it, it sounded like the question was, you know, someone who's starting with open sips and is. No, yeah, you know, that's what I'm saying. You, know, you just run the configurator. You select you select on the list what, yeah, you what said, your use you cases. Said, uh, I think uh, you uh, let's say you put the finger on the ones. The fundamentals are the same. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say doing a transition from two one to let's say to two point four. Okay, there are additions like different kind of new modules or let's say getting the clustering support. Okay, which are not covered in the books. Um, but uh, again, to get the basics, even the old uh, 2.1 book, it's still uh, it's still perfect uh, uh, valid. Um, in terms of let's generating documentation, because at the end of the day, a book is also kind of documentation. Uh, we are still trying to find what's the best uh, the best way, because you know the books are in terms of 
lifespan. Okay, they are covering a special and uh, okay, particular version of open source, and then that means maximum one year. You know, after that, you know, the book is outdated. And what do you go? You go and buy another book. So we are looking in a, to a more dynamic way of you know packing all this uh, all this information uh, uh, rather than let's say maybe going through through the through the books, which are quite impossible to update. <laughs> <laughs> but but the documentation online is you know it's got it's all there. Um, well, yes, and uh, well, uh, from uh, let's say we are doing uh, our best with uh, maintaining the code, and uh, in the same time we to welcome any kind of contribution from the community, helping with the documentation. Because that's uh, that's a <coughs> tremendous uh, effort with the documentation, and sometimes somebody from the community might be. Um, uh, more suitable to write documentation than actually the developer, because from the developer perspective, you know, you may overlook something because you know everything is clear for you. Uh, and say, oh yeah, that's clear, that's clear. You know, let's not mention it. So mm -hmm. actually, at the end of the day, say, yeah, everything is clear. Why, why, why writing documentation? <laughs> <Right. Especially laughs> While somebody from the community, you know, from outsider, let's mm -hmm. say, from the coding perspective, they may see the different uh, the things differently. They understand. Okay, they may identify what are the points that need to be better explained or not, or you know, how to structure to make somebody else in a similar level even to understand the, uh, the actual uh, uh, document. I think that's, that's you know, the, the mention of community is key for switch as well. You know, even if you don't code or you're not a SIP expert, just you can curious. always help out. You can always help out with documentation. Yes. So. Yeah. Bug marshalling. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's <laughs> favorite job. Yeah, no, the, the greatest thing about bug marshalling is you learn a lot from <laughs> bug marshalling. Mm. Like you really do. So it's a great way to start. Yeah. And uh, yeah, right now, um, maybe the let's say the conferencing date uh, is over. Uh, we we are heading for the social event for the for the dinner to um, something between a castle and the church here in Amsterdam, or where the restaurant is. So it's fun. It's uh, Vanderwaal. Uh, Wag. Yeah, uh, um, let's not get into the Dutch pronunciation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, it's it's awesome being here. I was going to say thank you for coming in, but we can come <laughs> yeah. in, we're all together. <laughs> thank you for joining us. <laughs> okay, Ken, well, live from live from the Open Sip Summit, um, goodbye, and back to you, Ken. Yeah. It helps if I can find the right train. <laughs> uh, okay. It really helps if I can find the right train. There we go. All right, guys. Hey, uh, Bogdan, uh, Dan, uh, Alex, Michael, thanks guys for coming in and uh, chatting about OpenSips today. Uh, there's a lot of uh, cool stuff going on in OpenSips and in FreeSwitch. So uh, next week, Michael will be back from another uh, location around the globe. So you guys check that out. Uh, we'll be back here uh, Wednesday at noon. Don't forget, follow us on Facebook, like us on Twitter. And if you're looking for more information on OpenShift, go to openshift.org. And if you want more free information on FreeSwitch, go to FreeSwitch.org. And don't forget our sponsor, SignalWise. Thanks, guys. Have a great week. You've been watching KuCon Weekly. Tune in every Wednesday at 12 p.m. Central. Keep up with the latest happenings by subscribing to our YouTube channel, follow us on Facebook and Twitter, or visit us at freeswitch.com.